go to 28,000 feet right off the coast of Catalina. Whatever that object was dropped right down to the surface of the water. These things were breaking the sound barrier, but there was no big boom. Freaked us all out. We didn't even know how to respond to it. Came from outer space all the way down to 28,000 feet and stopped. It was so outside of our experience, we didn't know what to do. They looked like about a 50-foot long giant tic-tac. Pure white, no doors, no windows, no nothing. Same size of his aircraft, approximately. Whatever that object was, it went to Fast Eagle's assigned cap station. The exact latitude, longitude, and altitude. It stopped. How in the hell did it know where that cap point was? It was a secret location, only in secret message traffic. They knew where our intent. Welcome to High Strange. I sat down with senior radar operator for the U.S. Navy, Kevin Day. In 2004, he was aboard the USS Princeton, a naval-guided missile cruiser, when strange objects began to appear on his screen. Over the course of several days, he continued to see large tic-tac-shaped objects running circles around the Navy jets, raising the legitimate concern of a possible mid-air collision. They were zigzagging all over the sky like a flywood, doing impossible things, darting all over the place, creating G-forces, 35 Gs, 40 Gs. That would make us into pancakes. A pilot can survive maybe eight or nine G-forces. I don't think there's anything biological in these things. You all saw it? Mm-hmm. Yep. We all saw it. It shook me to my core. Truly did. They watched on radar these unknown objects dive from over 80,000 feet in the air to the very near surface of the ocean in a matter of seconds. They were long, 50-foot, cylindrical objects, white in color, no windows, and no doors. And by appearance, they were rotorless, with no signs of propulsion. We were concerned about safety of flight. I was at meetings. Hey guys, I got something for you. What's up, Kev? We have a safety of flight issue off the Southern California coast. And when I went to describe what happened to us in 04, I got laughed at, man. What do you mean? They laughed. UFOs, ha ha ha. And the people who weren't laughing, they were giving me this kind of look, looking down their nose like, what's he been smoking? It was real. I mean, pilots saw it with their eyeballs. It's on every ship's radar. And those radars are really good at what they do, trust me. I was concerned about safety of flight, man, for airliners too. I got so frustrated no one would listen, I quit. Commander David Fravor flew his F-18 Super Hornet towards the object, and it crossed directly in front of the nose of his jet, then took off out of sight. When the object appeared again, it was at the exact location the jets were supposed to rendezvous at a secret, undisclosed set of coordinates. Five years after the Tic Tac incident, Kevin Day resigned from the Navy. In 2017, while volunteering at a country club near his house, he was carrying a plate of fish and chips when he noticed the breaking news on the TV. Unexplained aerial phenomena. This Navy video showing the pilot's reaction to the strange aerial encounter. The Pentagon released three videos of unknown flying objects to the public. I stood there frozen, I dropped the plate of food I was carrying. After over 20 years in the Navy, being mocked and laughed at by the Department of Defense, he was finally vindicated. He beelined to his house in a daze. I raced home, probably broke every traffic law in this little town to get home. Jump on the computer, call my friends, and deal with it, you know? Because what else are you going to do? If it was you, what would you do? I have no idea. Right, exactly. We're just human, right? When he got home, he started calling other sailors aboard the USS Princeton, people who also witnessed the event. Now that the news had broken, he wanted to make sure they could all stick together, and he urged them to come forward and talk about the incident openly. We can't let Commander Fravor twist in the wind by himself here because we were there and we know what happened. We have to validate what he's saying. So that's how that all started. Both the New York Times and Politico broke the news that the Pentagon had been investigating UAPs for a decade. This UAP task force was officially known as the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. The leader of the operation, Lou Elizondo, had just resigned, claiming he left the program for similar reasons as Kevin Day, 
His higher ups were simply not taking this seriously. I think what happens from this point forward, the science teams get on the ball around the planet and we start collecting science data on these things. UAP is knowable. We can know what these are. We're worried about paying the rent and making sure the electric bill is paid and the kids are on school in time and they're healthy, well-dressed. Who the hell's got time to think about aliens, you know? We have to live in the daily life. What if the entire planet has to change all of a sudden and we're not prepared? That's what the scientists are saying now. Hey, get ready for the societal impacts. Looking back on this, I wouldn't trade a moment of what I went through. Because you know what? The things that happened to me are going to be a powerful damn message when I go to Congress. That's how I'm going to transmute this. I'm going to turn it into a message that they are going to have to listen to. I feel so damn lucky. I can't even express how lucky I feel. How blessed I am. What an honor. What an honor. It was all worth it. All of it. To get the message out. Whether we like it or not, whether we admit to it or not, these things are coming. Accept it. I don't want anything. I don't want money. I don't want fame. I want the world to get ready for what's about to happen. That's what Kevin Day wants. It was so cool to see a space shuttle launch or a landing and realize my dad was instrumental in doing that. This is John Greenwald, the founder and creator of theblackvault.com. And after he retired, I found out he worked on the Mars lander. I found out he worked on the space defense program. So there's a lot about him that I didn't know until after he retired. And my dad, he has um, really kind of, I think, instilled in me the fascination with space and stretching the limits of what science can do. I started way back when I was 15 years old, a incident in 1976 one of the very few UFO documents that you could go and read and download. And it read very much like a X-Files episode, a science fiction movie. It just didn't make sense. One UFO was seen over the city of Tehran, Iran. A second UFO was seen coming out of that one, a third coming out of the bottom, one of which the F-4 Phantom pilot saw hover above the ground and cast this large light. Just like the Tic Tac in 2004, the Tehran UFO incident involved not only eyewitnesses, but radar pings of something strange in the sky. The pilots began to engage the UFO over Iran's capital city. And as they got closer, both F-4 Phantom jets lost controls of their onboard weapon systems. As they turned off from the pursuit and headed back towards their base, magically, all their communication and weapons functions began working again. And this happened to both of the jets. During this whole event, two separate F-4 Phantom jets seemingly were strategically shut down, losing controls, communications, as they were engaging this UFO, whatever that was. One could potentially be a coincidence. Two, however, seemed strategic. and It seemed like technology. There's really not a feasible explanation for it, even to this day. So the question mark is, well, what was it and why? We're talking about 1976 here. With all this time that passed, I mean, maybe we'd see something similar. Maybe we'd have a viable explanation at this point. We have nothing. We have neither. This was almost 30 years before the Tic Tacs were seen. How could an adversary like Russia or China have such a tight lid on some advanced technology like this for so damn long? That was the first document that I got when I was 15. And I thought, man, the internet has to have more. And that's what kind of drove me and motivated me to go back and look. And there really wasn't anything. You just saw more of the he said, she said stories. There were chat forums, message boards at the time. Nobody really had the, the, the full story. And if they were telling the same story, they were telling it in different ways. And it was so frustrating. So that's why I started utilizing the FOIA and then just going after these documents because I figured, hey, if this four page document exists, there have to be more. And sure enough, there was a lot more. 
The Freedom of Information Act is essentially a law here in America that allows anyone in the world, you actually don't even have to be an American citizen, to access information. You request information, they have to send it to you. But the fine print allows nine different reasons for them to say no. Those nine different what they call exemptions are those redactions that you see. Freedom of information. We can go after information. Government and military has got to send it to us. Problem is, they put in nine reasons for them not to send it. To see things that the American public and the world have never seen before, to get documents, to get videos like old film reels, it's such an amazing feeling because you're seeing history that only a select few people that had clearances or that were involved in the project have seen before. I was, you know, 15, I was stupid. I, I, I didn't realize exactly what I was getting my, myself into, but quickly learned that the government was gonna push back. And what I first wanted to achieve was essentially get these documents out and put them out in their raw form. I didn't anticipate the struggle that there was gonna be to get it. Being that 15 year old curious kid, I, I didn't know a whole lot about it. I just knew there was something there what was this Freedom of Information Act, but hey, they're gonna send me something for free, cool. And that's what I kind of went for. The Freedom of Information Act, building a website and just kind of going from there. And I take it to kind of the next level for me where I put it online for everybody. Here we are 26 years and 3.2 million pages later, <laughs> I haven't gone anywhere. People can download with the click of a button in seconds, what sometimes took me over a decade to get. Literally, for me, that drives some of the motivation to do what I do. John has been collecting documents released via FOIA request since he was 15 years old. I wasn't even remotely productive with anything at that age. I 